All right, questions? I graded about a little less than 10 exams an hour, which is what I'm only spending. Hopefully, I mean, use about 60 seconds of problem when I was looking at when I look at your work, which a lot of people think that's pretty short. But 85 exams that'll put me in about eight plus hours worth of grading, so which is always fun. Um, what I expect, I mean, good and bad. I mean, that's that's the hard part about a lot of this. This isn't one of those things where you can fake it. We either get it or don't, and when you have a problem, you either know it or not. It's just how it is. The hard part is grading a fake it. It's where you, I didn't know what's going on, and I'm going to write a lot of words, but then I have to prove, I have to show that, right? It's like, well, that didn't connect to that. That doesn't make sense. It's, whereas it was like a lot of words, but you just made a small reasoning mistake. You know, finding the differences between the two are fun. So, but. Um, this is also where I get to introduce the next part, it, which is uh, there'll be a thing called extra credit proofs. Okay, starting before the next exam, what I'm going to do is I'll block out a certain amount of proofs that I consider uh, fundamental for the course. And what you can do is at any time during the semester in, in blocks, like, you know, for a few of them it'll be before the next exam, and then before the third exam, and before the fourth exam, it'll be done in, uh, or, three blocks of proofs. And we'll give a, I'll hand this out next class. Um, block one is, we'll do, and I'll explain this. For exam two. Two is going to be due before exam three. And then block three is going to be due before exam four. And what do I mean by do? This is uh, to do an extra credit proof. One of them will be the square twos are rational. So if you already done it, you can, you know, you can do it and get your extra credit points. And if you know, looked at the syllabus, this is, you get them all it adds like plus five to like the overall grade, which is like a half letter grade type of thing. Okay, what I mean by do is you've got to schedule time to have you show up to your office, and then I hand you a sheet of paper, which proof you want to do, and you do it. And then I look at it, and I'm like, no, that's not right, and then come back another time, try it again, right? And it's either 100% right, 100% wrong, you, you do it right there. If it's wrong, I'll explain why it's wrong, explain what you're doing wrong, and then you leave and you think about it for a while and you come back and you give it another shot. You can choose, choose to do this or not, it's just extra credit. Um, uh, this is also probably, ideally if we had small class sizes, this is what your exams would be, right? Where we wouldn't give A, B, C, D, and F, it's like you learn discrete math, right? If you didn't know discrete math, I would sit there and point out this is what you cannot do. You need to work this on this and this, we'll go, come back and do it, and we wouldn't give grades. It would be, oh, at the end of the semester, you knew how to do this. But this isn't, that's kind of funny. We call ourselves educators. We're more letter givers. It's like, oh, look, you're a B, a C, an A, right? Um, so in terms of do, you just simply stop by my office and do it. You know, I'm here every day. So free times are basically, you know, we have an hour after class between this one and the next one, and then on my Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, you know, after 11:30, you know, have we work on computers every now and then. I mean, that's my other part of my job, but you know, we can always fit in 
you know, things like this. This is also why I do it in blocks, because a lot of people are like, oh, look, there's extra credit, and they don't do it. And then week of finals, I want to do it. Right? Here, I want to do all of them. And it's just like, yeah, that's just not humanly possible for me to do that. And so it has to be scheduled out over time. And so if you pass that point and like at the end of the semester, well, I really needed to do it, the answer is sorry, you could have done it. Right. So there's a little bit of emphasis on you. Yep. Um, we say like one is due before exam two. Sometime before exam two. But it doesn't have to be like uh, for block three, it doesn't have to be after exam No, no, just before. You can do them all tomorrow. I mean, for the while, I want to give you what they are. Yeah, but. Uh, some of them you're probably going to have to do after exam three because the proofs are not going to be here at the beginning. You know, there'll be proofs of number theory, like what's the fundamental theorem? You know, prove the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which is going to require induction and other tools that we won't learn until later. And most of these were, a portion of these will be on exams anyways. So if you study for them and, and it's like, hey, look, I'm just going to verify that I know how to do this. And I'm going to, and these are also graded a, a little bit more detailed. Because I'm going to ask you questions. Oh, like I memorized this. What about that? What does that mean? Do you understand that? Answers, I don't know. All right, that doesn't count. I want you to know what these are. So that's what these are going to be. So. All right. Um, I started off at the beginning of uh, the semester talking about that this class is kind of a you know, I like to talk about toys and rules, and this class is a constant reboot that's built in on old things, right? So the very first block of math was the objects that we dealt with were propositions, and the rules were everything that we could do with propositions, one of the same, how do we put them together, how do we make compound propositions, what are ways of interpreting them, and then what are applications, all right? Again, everything up to exam one could, have, could be, if we wanted to, done in more detail and make it an entire semester course, All right? But that's that. Now that we have it as a tool, we're going to say, okay, this is an ability that we all have. We all understand that form of math, just like we all understand calculus and algebra and trig in, in terms of applications. Now we're going to go on and make a new one and talk about a new type of math. And starting on chapter two, we're going to move on to set theory. So this is our new math. Right, the idea, it's new maths. So really what I mean by new math is we, we are talking about um, new objects with new rules. Remember hold, I might as well say toys. New toys and new rules. And now the toys and rules that we're going to be building up are going to be using logic, uh, especially when we do something as uh, seemingly straightforward as set theory. And we're going to take it, so today we're going to talk about the objects themselves, what are we going to be studying, and then we'll do a little bit of operations on them. But unlike uh, logic, we introduced our objects, propositions, and we had to wait a while until we could talk about comparisons. What does it mean to be logically equivalent? With sets, the way that they're designed, we can talk about the objects and immediately talk about comparisons before we have to go on to how do they interact with one another in terms of combinations of old sets into new sets and, and other properties of it. So today we're going to actually define what's our objects, how do we compare our objects, how do we represent our objects, and then eventually we'll get into operations and applications of them. All right, like everything in math, you know, this idea of new is kind of arbitrary because these things come about for a reason. Propositions were, you know, this declare something to be true or false. We fundamentally understand what it means. When we did rules of inference, right, these tautologies, these things are true. Why? Well, not only can I show it and model it and make these little true-false tables and everything else and do this work, I knew it because they had applications. They came into being to model things. We modeled discussions. We modeled reasoning. And from that, we knew already that it worked, right? 
because we had discussions before we formalized it, and people could say, you know what, I know Mark is telling me the truth, I know Mark is lying. We knew that before we formalized it, so we might as well model it. The same thing is here, right? We have a reason for this. And so we're going to talk about sets. Now, in particular, this is, uh, for this definition, this is actually going to be naive set theory rather than just simply set theory. Um, which would be act, true set theory is normally axiom, axiomatic set theory. Uh, we're going to just deal with naive because it's easier to deal with. But for you, you said a set. We've dealt with them before. You know, if we're going to have a whole branch of mathematics on these objects, what would you think a set is? We have grouping, we have collection, we have a wording of a bunch of, of individual objects, right? Like I have a set of chairs, I have a set of desks, I have a set of students, we have a set of buildings on campus, right? We know what they are fundamentally. I mean, that's the thing. We've been dealing with them, and now we're going to try to have to, okay, they are, we have sets, so we need to go ahead and write down what they are. And we'll actually, at the very end of the second semester, get to an issue where mathematically, normally what we try to do, we know things are, and we're working with them, now we try to write it down so we can formalize it intellectually, because we want to model it. Right? We'll actually run into things that we can't, maybe ever, but maybe just not now, define certain things. When we get into computational you know, modeling, we'll actually get to things that we'll try to actually give it a formal definition, but we can't come up with one. And it's kind of loose, and so uh, we won't have a theory um, when we get to that. You'll actually have something a little bit it's looser than that. You know, just we're kind of proposing what things are. But for us, set theory, we'll have a good definition. Um, one of the things I'd like to say is it's unordered. Because normally we talk about a set of buildings on campus. Do you think the order that I name the buildings are really matters? Now, if I say there's a set of chairs in this room, is there an order to this? Well, I could put an order on the chairs, but when I talk about the word set, I could stack them all in a corner, and I really wouldn't care. If I put them all at desks, I really wouldn't care. It's just a bunch of chairs. And so this is an unordered collection of objects. Normally, the objects uh, have a better name, and they're called elements. And there's a reason why, because I'm using this definition of a set, an unordered collection of stuff, unordered collection of elements, that this is called naive set theory. Because this definition of an unordered collection of objects can actually lead to impossibilities. And the easiest example is uh, the barber the male barber who will only give a shave to a person who has never shaved himself, right? And so you would have, okay, I'm going to divide up the world into two sets for guys, right? All right, the guys that this barber can shave and that the guys this barber cannot shave. And so we just simply split the world up. Have you ever shaved? Yes. All right, you can't, you can't go to him. Have you ever shaved? No. All right, you can go to him. And the reason why this is naive set theory is where does he go? If he's never shaved, then he's in the group he's allowed to do, but that means he has to shave himself, but he's not allowed to shave himself because that's the road he's not allowed to, so he has to go to the other group. So which one is he in? And it's a paradox. If he's in the first group, he must be in the second, but if he's in the second group, he must be in the first. And so we just have an impossibility. So if that's your definition of sets, unordered collections of elements, you could easily get to kind of some things that have paradoxes that occur. So what we do is the typical mathematical approach is one of the reasons why I call this naive. That simple definition can lead to problems, and so what we rather do is if you ever get a problem, skip such things. So naive set theory does not deal with such things. So you would simply say, oh look, this could lead to a problem. We won't talk about that one. We try to put them off into special cases. Axiomatic set theory tries to create axioms at the beginning so that those become impossibilities, so we don't have to worry about how they exist or not. But naive is good enough for most of the things that we deal with. All right. 
Um, some terms we can say things like a set contains its elements. Those we can actually have as a notation. If element little a is is in set, say capital A, this is typically what we do. We use lowercase for elements, uppercase for sets. We use the following notation. Little a is an element of set A. If element A is not in set A, we write it this way. Little a is not in set A. And that's the element of symbol, kind of looks like an E, kind of looks like an epsilon, it's not. It's the element symbol. That's the element of. All right. So we have ways of reading capital letters for sets, little letters for elements. Uh, we've talked about containing uh, sets themselves. How do we represent, represent them? All right, so our new form of math, sets themselves are the toys. That's what we're going to play with. And so we have some terms for them. We have a little bit of notation for them. But if I'm going to be working with sets, I'm going to need to be able to represent them. The first one is called a roster or list. It's pretty easy. The idea of representing a set with a roster or a list is to simply say, okay, here's set A. It's made up of a square, a triangle, a happy face, the number one, um, three plus two i, the complex number, and then mm, how about the capital letter A, and then mark. What can be in sets? Stuff, right? Anything you want. Okay, what can you put in a set? You could put in objects of, that are geometric, you could put in numbers, you could put in people, you could put in sets, right? This could here be actually, you know, this kind of self-recursive problem. What's in A? A, right? Maybe it's a different set of a particular type. You can really put whatever you want in here. Sometimes it'll look funny. Say, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to put the set of the numbers 1, 2, and 3. And then I'm going to put in the number 2. And then I'm going to put the set of negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. My 3's keep looking like. Okay. If I would look at this, I actually have 1, 2, 3 objects in there, right? Two of my objects happen to be sets. One of the objects happens to be a number. Curly bracket just represents, I'm going to, everything in here is going to represent a list of stuff. What can I put in there? Anything you want. The book will take advantage of that and make you look at really weird by making sets of sets of sets of sets. You know, have like all these nested parentheses and then you've got to figure out, okay, who's on the inside, who's an element, who's not. All right, but in the end, it really doesn't matter what we put in it. Uh, when we do roster methods, a lot of times we'll have, say, set S is made up of, say, one, two, three, ellipsis, ten. All right. If you don't want to write all of the elements, you can use the ellipsis to say, do you catch the pattern? I'm going to have ten objects here. I'm just not going to write all ten. Um, please be careful. I've had students who say, oh, I, see four, I see five elements, and one of the elements is dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and it's like, no, I meant ellipsis, right? Because it is a symbol, right? 
You know, and that's strictly speaking, you could read that that literally, and then the person would be right. And then it's like, darn. Um, but if we look at that, the idea is, do you see the pattern? And you could put an end to it. Um, you could have, say, the set S and say negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 right? All of the integers, you know, things of that nature. And so roster method requires either you list all of them out or have a rule that's in there that you don't, which that's what the ellipsis means, right? The ellipsis is we all understand the rule, follow the pattern. Right, the rule is just by observation. That's the only time that you'll be allowed to put that in, is when that rule is obvious. All right. Um, sometimes that's not good enough. Uh, it's hard to be able to write things that have a lot of elements. And let's say that you look at the rule, and the rule's a lot more complicated than you could possibly figure out. Say, for example, like irrational numbers. Then we move on to set builder notation. Set builder notation is set S is made up of, okay, we write the beginning of the, of the set symbol. But now what I write now is a object variable, a bar, which means such that. So it's an object variable. Uh, bar, which actually means the word such that. And on this side is a propositional function. On object E. What do I mean? All right, say for example, let's say set S is made up of all X such that X is an integer and X is greater than or equal to 1 yet less than 11. I could have written this in roster form, right? <clears throat> in roster form, this would have been rather easy. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. That's in roster. All right? What's the advantage to set builder notation? The advantage to set builder notation is that you can build complicated elements. The question is, when is it in the set? When the propositional function evaluates the true. Things that are not in the set, the propositional function evaluates the false. So now we could actually get to, for example, uh, the rational numbers. They are going to be, say, they're usually represented as a double bar Q. And these are all A over B such that A B are integers, and B is not zero, and A, B have no common factors. Everybody care of that? So everything that we wrote before, you know, that was just simply a propositional function. Uh, if those three things are true, that's a rational number. If the, one of those is not, it is not a rational number. And so now I could actually have the set. The hard thing is, like, could you imagine trying to write the rational numbers in the list? Okay. Okay. Actually, we will get to a thing that we will actually show that you can. And there is a pattern to it. Uh, the hard part is finding such a thing. Um, the other way that we can represent these besides 
as a list or set builder notation, we could graphically do it. And the great way we would graphically do it is a Venn diagram. All right, for the Venn diagram, we have a big square that's absolutely required. The big square has a U label on it. All right, what's the U represent? The U represents uh, the universal set. Really, it's the universe of discourse. Think of set builder notation. What are all the possible things that could go into your propositional function? That's your universe of discourse, right? It's every element that we're going to be possibly checking. So we have to write a square. I've had a lot of students that keep forgetting to put the big giant rectangle. The big giant represent rectangle is the universe of discourse. That's who we're talking about. We have to have it. And then you would then write circles. So, a circle is a set. Normally, you'll label it like with a capital. Um, you can put the, the label right beside it. Other times, instead of putting the label right beside it, you might break a small part of your circle and then put the label at that edge. Right? put an S right through there and the idea is that the line goes through it. If you want to break it that way, it's your choice. I tend to put it on the outside. And elements are simply dots. And so, and again, say that's a lowercase and well, let's make that one here, that S. So capital labels, little case for the elements. And then really, if you look at it, it's a visual roster method, right? You just put dots for your elements in a circle that contains all of the elements. And now what's nice about the Venn diagrams is that you can see things where the propositional function has evaluated the true, the elements on the inside, and you also see the elements on the outside for the entire universe of discourse. So it's more of a visual representation of rosters without necessarily having to write all of the elements. Sometimes I'll ask you to do that, other times I won't. All right, so we can write sets, we can write elements, we can do sets in a list, we can do sets as set builder notation, we can do sets in a Venn diagram. Now that we have the basic ways of representing them, there are some fundamental ones we should know. We have number sets. We have the natural numbers, which is a double bar n, is 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., up to never stopping. So the natural numbers are the whole numbers plus 0. Uh, we have the integers, which is a double bar z, which is all the integers. We have a double bar z plus, which is the whole numbers, it's the positive ints. One, two, three. So we have natural numbers, we have the integers, we have the positive integers. Uh, we already have our rationals, which are going to be set builder notation. These are all a over b such that a, B, might as well write it this way. A is a integer, and B is a integer, and B is not zero, and I'll just say no, and everybody know, knows what I mean. No common factors. Uh, we have the reals. Real numbers. 
Uh, writing those in any particular form, if I say, okay, could I write this, you know, in some particular way and give a rule for it, and you kind of scratch your head and say, can I think of a, it's like we kind of all know what real numbers are. If you actually want to give it a descriptor of some sort, you could say an R is representative of all X, such that X has a decimal form. If you use the words has a decimal form, you can actually split off the reals in the, sorry, the rationals and the irrationals across the decimals. Um, the rationals are the decimals that terminate or repeat. The irrationals are the de decimals that don't do that, which means that they would not terminate and they would not repeat. And so that allows us to sometimes have a natural way of splitting the concept of reals, and this is kind of important. So we could go over here to say, um, we could have the rationals means decimal terminates or repeats. Now, if we would look at that and the irrational is not rational. What is not terminate or repeat? Let's use the Morgan's Law. It would not terminate and not repeat, right? And so that would be the irrationals. Uh, this would be a decimal that doesn't terminate and doesn't repeat. If I wanted to, I could have examples of stuff like that. Say 1.01 or 1.222 repeating, right? Both of the ones on the left, if I could, if we could actually even find it, right? We could represent as a integer over integer in simplest form with no common factors, and the bottom is not zero. Everything like that. On the other hand, I could take this one. Say 1.01001001. Even though you see the pattern, I can put it in the ellipsis because we can see the pattern. Does that pattern cause the decimal to stop, which is an infinite number of zeros? No. Does it ever repeat a block of numbers fixed? No. That means that the numbers on the left can be written as an integer over an integer in simplest form, but the number on the right cannot. Kind of interesting. And then we can go into the complex numbers, which is a double bar C. And complex numbers are simply equal to A plus BI such that A is a real number and B is a real number. And I happens to be the square root of minus 1. Right? Which is imaginary. So those are the classic numbers that we need to understand. So whenever we say things like real numbers, complex numbers, rational numbers, positive ints, ints, and the natural numbers, we should know which ones we're talking about. At double bar n could also be called the non-negatives, right? For the naturals. Other ones that we should know besides the number sets. Two, the empty set. Empty or null set. All right, it's always important to represent nothing. I mean, it used to be for a long time, people's like, why do I need a representation for something that is not? And it's like, zero is a modern concept. It ends up being that, no, we actually need to have such things. And so the empty set of the null set is a zero with a strong line through it. And it, what it represents is a set that has nothing in it. It's the collection of nothing. What's amazing is how many properties the collection with nothing actually has. I shouldn't be saying it's that surprising because like the number zero, you know, the number zero under arithmetic is the additive identity, but it's the multiplicative dominator. 
right? You have all these things that and it's like, when can it be used? When can it not be used? And that same thing is with the empty set. You know, what's interesting about the empty set, when we talk about comparisons, the empty set ends up a set that's actually inside of all sets. And well, if we would compare it to others. Uh, the third would be the universal set. U, which is really, this is actually the universe of discourse. It's like, what objects are you considering to be any, being in your set? It's the universe of discourse. All possible elements of interest. Obviously, there's lots of universes of discourse, so there's lots of universal sets. There's not one universal set. It's like, what elements are you talking about? Are you talking about numbers? Then the universal set is all possible numbers. Are you talking about students? Then the universal set is all students. Right? They aren't the same ideas. Possible ideas of collections. Uh, the fourth thing would be singleton sets. Singleton sets, S, are simply L sets that have one element. All right, so those are all sets that we sh we're supposed to know. So we've described our toys. We can draw toys. We can represent toys. Here, here we're dealing with sets. And now we're going to say, okay, what are we going to do with them? What are the operations? For today, we're not going to talk about all the operations. We're going to simply talk about the first t large class of them, which is comparison. And actually, I ought to put plural, because we're going to talk about four types of comparison. We had logical equivalencies, we had one, right? These are logically equivalent. We're going to say sets, and we're going to say we're going to develop four different ways of comparing two sets. So if I hold a set in my right hand and a set in my left hand, there's going to be four different things that I can talk about between those two sets. All right, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the idea of a subset. All right, since sets are collections of elements, uh, probably the most natural concept of a subset would be possibly re would be represented as a Venn diagram. And I would sit there and I would look at, say, here's my universe of discourse. Um, here is my set. Say B. And then here is my set. Say A. You know, sometimes we would look at elements, right? And we have some elements sitting around like this, right? And I look at this and I say, you know what? These are collections of elements and these, you know, it's easier to represent the, the set notation visually here with the Venn diagram to collect all its elements in a roster. I notice that all the elements that are in A happen to be in B. Which would say that the set A probably is another way of thinking of it is in B. Well, how can I represent that visual representation? And notation-wise, we're going to say that A seems to be smaller, right? Kind of like a smaller symbol. How did you represent smaller in arithmetic? Like one number is smaller than another number. Less than, or possibly if it was loose and I didn't allow, I'd say less than or equal, right? And so I would say that A is smaller in a way. I'm going to use the same sort of shape. So it's not a inequality symbol. It's a cup that represents the same idea, right? And or equal to B. Now, what does it mean? It says, well, I would like to say it looks like everything in A is in B. 
How would you represent that in logic? So I would say A is a subset of B. That's what this is read as. If and only if. all elements, for all elements that I see, if that element is inside of A, then that element has to be inside of B. Everything in A is in B. Is that true? All A's are B's. That's what I just said. All A elements are B elements, which means that if it's in A, then it's in B. Is everybody okay with that being a definition? Seems to make sense? If and only if? No. Uh, this symbol, A, is going to be called a subset if and only if that entire thing is true. That's what we're saying. I shall call to set A a subset of B only when all A elements are B elements. And what if somebody says, well, I just noticed that all A elements are B elements. Then call A a subset of B. That's what we mean by F and only F. And since that's a tautology, that F and only F is actually a logical equivalency. Being a subset means, literally, all A elements are B elements. So that's a subset. Well, the other thing would be if we would look at this particular problem, like we had, and let's say that I knew, like for this one, you know, maybe you didn't know that there's actually some elements in B. Like you looked at that and I said, I don't really know if there's elements that are in B but not A, right? You know, A might actually grow to B. Maybe, there, maybe this entire place is actually empty. Right? And so we say, maybe that entire thing's actually empty or not. Well, we would just simply say it's a subset. But on the other hand, if you know if A is a subset of B and B has elements A doesn't have then we say that this is a proper subset. So we have subsets. We have proper subsets. Well, what's a proper subset? A is a proper subset of B. What does that mean? That means that, okay, for all elements, If the element is in A, then the element is in B, which is the same thing, saying all A's are B. And you can find some other element. Let's pick something beside E, you know, X, such that the X is in B and that X is not in A. B has something A does not. It's bigger. Strictly bigger. Visually what that's saying is there is literally an element here that's in B and not in A. Then I would say it's a proper subset. If I do not know if that element exists, I would say it's at least a subset. Subset's weaker. It allows A to actually be B. All right, so we have subset. We have proper subset. Um, a third would be, a third type of thing would be equal. What do you think it means for A to be equal to B? Same amount. Everything in A is in B. Everything in B is in A. Right? It's the actual same quote-unquote set. What does that look like? Logically, that would say, for all elements, if it's in A, then it's in B. But if it's in B, it's in A, by condition. 
here's a kind of a fun, you also could note, what's another way of writing a biconditional? Left implies right and right implies left. But that would be subset notation. That says that A equals B means that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. So if you want to use subset notation, we could write it that way. Because the biconditional says A implies B means A is a subset. B implies A means B is a subset. So if you would show both those subsets, you've actually showed equality. Um, odd features. Interesting things. One, the empty set is a subset of any set. The empty set is a subset of all possible sets. Why do you think that's true? What's the logical interpretation of subset? For all elements, the element has to be in the left implies that the element must be in the right. And this has to evaluate the true. Uh, is the element in the empty set? What's in the empty set? Nothing. So this is actually logically what? For all elements, false implies that the, em the element is in S. But what's that? That's true, vacuously. So the empty set's inside of everything. It's pretty easy to see if we would look at it this way. Um, if I look at my universe of discourse and I write a circle here, I keep trying to write a circle rather than just simply doing my circle out. And let's say I put my elements here, dot, 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 dot. Can you always draw a circle in a circle that doesn't contain any elements? Sure. Empty sets inside of everything. You just draw a circle that doesn't contain any elements in the other sets. It has to be in there. So it's a subset of everything. Kind of an interesting feature. It's like, so what's one of the properties of an empty set? It's a subset of all sets, including itself. Um, a set is a subset of itself. That's just a trivial truth. Another one that's kind of awkward here is this. One, one, two, three, four, four, four. And compare this to one, two, 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 three, three, four, four. Now look at those two and look at the definition of equality. The definition of equality says if an element is in A, then it must be in B. If an element is in B, then it must be in A. Is the number one in the left? Does that imply that the number one is in the right? Yes. Is the number one in the left and the right? Yes. Is the number two in the left and the right? Yes. Is the number three in the left and the right? They're equal. What does equality check? Not multiple things of the same element, just the existence of the element. Equality checks distinctness. Right? It simply says, is there a one? Well, I have, five, I have two of them. Is there a one? That's what I asked. Is one in the set? I don't care if you have a hundred or you have one of them. Do you have it? The answer is yes or no. And so we do not care about multiplicity. And so because of that, that allows for a question of problems of where students get, get caught up on is the idea of distinct. So a lot of times, because of this issue, since multiples don't matter,
on equality. So usually we will stay with distinct elements. In other words, if you have multiples of something, don't write it. So normally we would rather simply say, okay, so when I talk about distinct, I would say things like, okay, one, two, three, four, versus the above. <coughs> Those are the distinct elements. So most of the time when we write sets, we're going to write elements as they are in a distinct way rather than a non-distinct way. So we have ways to compare. We can talk about subset, proper subset, equality, and might as well say this last one just to do it. D is cardinality, which is equal to the number of distinct elements. Count the distinct elements, we'll call that the cardinality. So the cardinality of 1, 2, and 3 with a 5 is 4, right? I see four distinct elements. In cardinality, we write it as an absolute value symbol, but it's actually a bar symbol. It says, how many distinct elements do you see? So distinctness is matters to us. So we have four ways to compare. Cardinality, subset, proper subset of quality. And next time we'll do operations. All right. Uh, for attendance, next class, uh, 2.1, number 13.